All right, hey folks, um, my name is Jim McKenzie. For those of you who haven't met me, I'm a developer here at Funny Circle. Right now, I'm working on distributed systems reliability and performance testing. Um, I've been kind of bopping around the closure space for the last four or five years now. You might have seen me or like my trail of angry comments online as Artem. Um, I have a bit of a reputation here for being resident malcontent when it comes to closure and closure to ownership. So forgive me in my commentary as we move from this talk. Um, this talk is going to go over data log, or rather an implementation of data log I've been building for fun in my spare time. Um, apologies for the slides, such as they are. They're not slides, they're my speaker notes. Um, I intended to make slides, and getting this demo and everything else working wound up taking more time than I had budgeted, so this is what we've got to work with. Um, Elf in the room time. Who here has used Datomic before? One, two, three, four, okay, good. Fewer hands than I was expecting to see. Who here has used a relational database before? It should be most of you. All right, good, it is most of you. Um, who, you who of you here has actually tried to build a relational database before? Like, be it for like a school project or just sheer self pay trade? Okay, I see three, four hands, okay. All right, cool. All right, so six, go ahead. Six in Portland? Or one more hand. All right, well, all the other questions where a lot of people. <laughs> Excellent. Um, sorry, I can't see the Portland feed. Let me actually get that up on my laptop here. Oh, it's really far. So yeah, I can't, worry, I can't even do it without messing up my, this, my screen share. Sorry. Um, cool. So this, we're going to just go through like building a database, um, mainly for fun. So before we kind of you know dive in here, what even is a database? What are we doing? Um, in the like mid early late 60s, we got the first data stores, right? Like computers got fast, we got tape storage, and suddenly businesses other than the government were able to start warehousing data. They wanted to find stuff again. Um, and the early database designs were all really crude. It was like you know Fortran with function with pointers to other memory addresses on the tape and like doubly linked lists, and that's what we had to work with. My mom actually ran one for the Navy for a while. It was weird. Um, and then in 1969, uh, EF Cod presents a fairly simple paper called the Relational Data Model, which is what most of what we'll be working with tonight. Um, and the idea with the Relational Data Model is that, you know, let's say we have some, some data here, right? So being closure developers, you, you've all read maps before, I hope, uh, with you know, the exception of those of you who aren't closure developers. So this is a sequence of two records. The first has a type that's developer, so this is just namespace key, and it's got some data, right? This happens to be me, right? Um, I got some nicknames. And you know, just for the sake of having two, we're gonna have another one that's also developer, Edzer Dijkstra, and you know, this one's a nickname, right? So in a pre-relational data store, this might actually get laid out as like, a sequence of structs on a tape with a pointer to the next one and a pointer to the previous one, and like maybe some pointers to substructs at best, right? Very, very manual. And manipulating these is hard, Not like doing search on them is hard, and migrating, evolving them was very, very difficult because they were tightly coupled with their disk representation. The insight of the relational data model is, you know, well, we can take these maps kind of structures, we can break them apart, right? And we can start thinking about them as tuples. So in closure, maps are sequences of key value pairs, which is getting close. Um, and so if we break this all the way down, you know, we see, okay, well, we have this thing that's just a pair, right? Type developer, another one that's this type, name of some other stuff, another one's a nickname of some stuff. And once we realize that we can go from maps to tag tuples, right? We can even go further than that. We can break the tag tuples down and go to just like sequenced tuples. Um, so we can actually like elide the keys entirely and go here, you know, we've got, you know, a, another map and we can just like inline the keys all the way out, right? And, and get a representation that's very compact if we want to. Um, so, okay, so we can take a map, we can project all the way down to a tuple. Why do we even care? Um, for completeness, I'm just going to mention like tables and columns here, right? Because I'm the table and column terminology is everywhere. Once you have a collection of tuples, they're traditionally referred to as a table, as long as they're like sort of homogenous and have a single consistent row set um, or column set. And 
the notation here is that we have you know a title that's just like naming labeling for individual columns in a tuple set and rows are a single like pair of tuples so this is you know to share the example above this is you know my foo one bar two tuple and a second tuple as a demo okay so we've got some data isomorphisms just we're shoveling bits around here we haven't fundamentally changed anything why do we care well the idea with the relational data model is that we can do a bunch of stuff with tuples. Particularly, we can like take sets of tuples and we can start doing stuff to them. We can, you know, union sets of tuples, we can intersect sets of tuples, and we can even like define some fairly complex operators. So the most the most essential one is just like Cartesian product, right? We're gonna take one sequence of tuples or one set of tuples and another set of tuples, and we're just gonna generate the set that's the cross product of concatenating all those tuples, right? So here we have the set, you know, tuple one, tuple two, and the set tuple three, tuple four. And if we Cartesian product those, we just get the four set back. That's one, three, two, three, one, uh, two, three, two, four. Typos already, wait, what? No, I went in a weird order here. I think it was right to start with. One, three, one, four. This is a strange example. Sorry. Two, three, two, four. There we go. Okay, that's at least right. Um, and we projection, right? So we're going to take a, tuple, a set of tuples and we're gonna just drop some stuff out of it. Why this was named the projection operator, I'm not really sure. I think it was to disambiguate from select, which is the next one. Um, so this is just saying, you know, we can take some tuple set ABC and we can slice it down to the tuple set AB by just dropping all the Cs. Um, this is useful if you have data that you're not going to use abstractly. Um, and then selection is kind of where it gets fun because we can say, you know, we're going to take some set of tuples and we're going to select from this tuple set R where in this case, you know, the, the B is R equal to B. And I didn't even do that one right either. What the hell? All right. This being the only valid tuple matching this criteria from the previous set that I just didn't even copy paste right. Um, cool. Okay. So tuples, tuple sets, join selects. That's really all the relational data model works with fundamentally. And then we have joins. And joins is where it gets interesting, right? Because the whole idea here is, well, we don't need to actually store these structures, because they are structures, like in their logical format, right? We can take them, we can decompose them to these tuple sets, and then we can use commonality in these tuple sets to bring them back together and recover the structure that we lost when we deformed these maps into tuples and then from tuples into like something that we serialized. So there's two like kinds of joins. There's a the full join or the natural join, which is, you know, for all the A's, for all the, so like given two tables, right? Join the table such that any common fields are equal. So in this case, if we have a table R and a table S, we're going to join where, you know, where the A's line up, right? So we get a new table back that's, you know, R bow tie S is the official pronunciation of that symbol amusingly. Um, that's just like take the, take the unique columns and concatenate tuple wise as appropriate. Uh, and the semi join is like the same as the join, except you're limiting to one field. So you're saying join on something as opposed to join on everything that's common. Um, or the purposes of this talk, when I say join, I really mean semi-join because all my examples happen to be structured such there's only one common field. Um, that is a thing that happens in practice. Um, but you, you, know, you could imagine having some tables R and S that have like multiple overlapping tables. So you could do like multiple directed joins or something else be directly between two things uh, or where the natural join might be interesting. Cool, so data log. I, I've, done a bit, I've done a bunch of beating around. What the? Okay, Ag spooking me with the AV here. Um, okay, so this, this is COD's relational calculus, right? That's just all it is, is we have tuples, we have projections on tuples, we have filter on tuples, and we have joins. And given that, we can actually get surprisingly far. Um, it's really an impressive paper that has stood the test of time well because it's fundamentally timeless, right? It, all we're saying here is we have tuples and we have knowledge on tuples. That's it. You can go build all kinds of other things on top of this fundamental substrate without really requiring much in the way it changes to it. And so I'm, I'm gonna draw an analogy here that like 
COD's relational calculus is to databases like the same thing that the Lambda calculus sort of has been to programming languages. It's a fundamental substrate that you can relate a lot of things back to that's interesting in and of itself, even if it's impractical just for this reason alone. It gives you a foundation for approaching everything else. So what's data log? Um, data log is surprisingly hard to pin down. There is a single conference proceeding from 1977 that like defines data log or the word data log is first used. Um, and I haven't been able to get a copy of it, but data log fundamentally is just an implementation of the relational calculus that it really, it does nothing more than what we've just run through except with some particular extensions. It came out of the um, prologue and the logic database tradition of the 1970s and early 80s. Um, and as such, the notation shares a lot of like, conceptually with prologue. Um, this, you know, just to show off some code, this is, this is in Souffle. It's another uh, data log implementation for the JVM, um, just because I could find it in Emacs mode to highlight this nicely. So in data log, you know, you have a fact, right? So we have some, uh, this tuple that's, you know, state Alaska. Okay, Alaska is a state, great. State Arizona, state Arkansas, you know, and then we can go on down. We can say, we got some cities that are in states and we have populations for cities. And we know that a couple of these cities happen to be capitals. In fact, all of them are capitals because I didn't want to go type out a whole wall of text for you. Um, and, you know, each one of these lines is defining a tuple in a database that we can then go manipulate, right? We can go write queries or joins on this stuff. The exact, there is no good agreed upon standard for data log beyond this tuple notation, unfortunately, which makes it incredibly difficult for me to stand here and like actually give you a realistic demo of like traditional data log um, beyond just like showing this notation of tuples into the fact store. Um, what we can do, the only other thing that's like really agreed upon is this notion of productions, right, or rules. So we can write queries, right, that define a new space of tuples by viewing other spaces of tuples or other spaces of rules. So in this case, we can say, you know, a, a capital, the capital of a state is, you know, it's constrained to, a, the state must be a state and the city must be a city in the state and the state must be tagged or the, and the city must be tagged with the capital tuple, right? So like the intersect of all these properties on these two logic variables, the, the question mark prefix symbols, um, defines a subspace of tuples that happen to have this, you know, set of properties all at once. Um, there's a bunch of things people have done to data log that are, you know, pretty interesting. So the most obvious one, the one that data log is most famous for, which unfortunately I don't implement yet, um, is recursive rules. So you can talk about having, you know, a production for rules that reference themselves. Um, implanting this is a really interesting research problem and it's fairly well understood, um, but slogging through all of that wasn't something I had time to do before this talk. So the implantation I'm gonna show doesn't get to do this. Um, but traditionally, data logs been used for a bunch of stuff like network connectivity analysis, right? Or, you know, computing data flow in compilers. And in this case, you want to be able to do recursive things like say, okay, well, one link in a, one node in a graph can, talk, can communicate with another link in a graph for modeling network, say, if, you know, there's a link between either the source and destination or recursively, there's a link between the source, some other thing, and that other thing has a link recursive, like has links recursively that reach the destination, right? Um, there's also negation. Uh, negation is an interesting one because negation actually really changes the way that data log evaluation ha ha has to proceed. Um, basically here we're saying, you know, there's a two hop link between a source and destination if there's a link between the source and some Z and there's a link between some Z and the destination, but there doesn't exist a direct link between the, um, from the source and the destination, sorry, typo again. Um, and this is sticky, right? This, this is a counter existence assertion. Everything that we've looked at so far is, is like positive existence statements. I can find a tuple such that, right? And with deletion semantics, data or like negation semantics, data log takes on um, some very different operational behavior that, you know, is worthy of discussion once we get into like a modern distributed system. Um, the really exciting thing to me is that uh, because data log is set oriented, it has this, you know, monoidal property to it. You know, you add tuples to the set and it strictly accretes and you can do fun stuff with this. Like 
pipes a stream. So if you, know, you want to take a Kafka stream of updates or something and feed that through a data log interpreter, you can actually do that. And it's correct from a, like a set theory and evaluation perspective. Um, this is actually exactly what Confluence case SQL does, except it takes a subset of SQL that happens to be differentiable and runs that over like a Kafka stream. Um, so there's a bunch of like really interesting stuff you can do here that's pretty modern for, you know, using this in distributed systems, you're like sticking it in the browser. Um, same thing again, because fundamentally data log operates, operates on tuples that have, you know, this monoidal property, like you can just shovel tuples around, right? Like your, your distributed system never loses data because all you're doing is strictly accreting data. So it can be anywhere. You can fold it in from anywhere and you can shovel it out anywhere. Um, it, it's very easy to work with, at least in theory. All right. So the yak, why on earth am I doing this? This is like not a thing that most reasonable people would choose to do. And you know, I'm employed by funding circles, so at least I'm that reasonable. Um, well, you know, this is my resident malcontent bit. Closure's documentation rots, uh, and it's rotted for a long time. I wrote Grimoire back in 2012, 2013, um, because I wanted to take a crack at making it better. Um, and yeah, there's a backing data store for it, LibGrimoire, that, that like falls into a lot of the same fundamental mistakes that early databases did. It's very place oriented. It makes a bunch of fundamental assumptions about the underlying data representation. And it's proven very difficult for anybody but me to manipulate because I was the one that wrote it and I don't know what the assumptions are. So like, if you're not me, good luck. Um, which was a mistake, honestly. It's, me, it's meant that other people can't come onto the project and contribute documentation or contribute meaningfully. Um, because like it's blocked on this thing that's bespoke. Um, and this is something I want to get rid of. Uh, but, you know, time. And I was in college and now I'm here and I have a job and it's not this, so it just hasn't gotten done. Um, in 2015, um, Richard Mohan did a really cool project that I helped him with uh, as part of Google Summer of Code that was called uh, Granada. And the idea with Granada was, okay, well, what if we could make documentation for closure or data structure? That was, that was first class and separately packaged and kind of like comparable to Java's you know, source, doc, source jars or doc jars, right? It, it's not this thing that's baked into your application anymore as runtime metadata. It's actually like a parallel structure that we can ship around in database and search index and you know, work with without doing scary code loading or JVM sandboxing or dependency resolution or any of that. Um, and the most interesting thing that Richard tried to do was talk about schemas. Right, so Grimoire made a bunch of reasonable, given the constraints of closure and closure script circle 2013, ex like assumptions about what a namespace looks like, what a var looks like, what like a Maven artifact ID looks like. But it's hard, to, it's hard coded to these, right? We now live in a world of like Depths Eden, where suddenly we want to be able to resolve things based on SHA sums and content hashes and maybe IPFS URLs or like all these other things. And suddenly the assumptions that I made way back when that you know, tied Grimoire to Maven ultimately don't make much sense. Um, so Martin Klepsch, I think, I hope I'm not munching his name, has been working on this really cool thing, uh, CLJ doc. He's trying to build a pipeline by which he can Take your, apple, take your jar, just pull it straight off of closure, or just run it in a Dockerized container, um, sandbox it that way, and then go pull metadata of it, right? So you can go take your source information, go take your doc strings, extract all of that from the sandbox environment and load it up as data and then do stuff with it. So the, his first project has been, you know, building something that's very closure docs like that works purely based on sandboxed uh, data extraction from arbitrary jars. And it's pretty awesome. Um, but, you know, for a next generation doc project like this to really take off, you need to get people on board with using it. Um, and part of that is like getting Google page rank foo. So your Google, like your stuff even shows up on Google. And a way to do that, that I'm fairly convinced of, of is like trying to document closure, right? If you can document any other library, why can't you document the core of the language, which year over year has been a pain point in the closure developer survey of why do the docs suck? Okay. So the, that's the kind of the broad context here. Um, so my goal is, you know, to support Martin and throw out the current grimoire generation, the current generation grimoire data store and build like a new data store thing that's data, that's data oriented and reusable and portable and embeddable 
and not like tied to me or the decisions that I make in error or in good faith as the case may be. So there's already some other people have built data logs for closure. Uh, Datomic, the elephant in the room, it's closed source. Uh, it doesn't embed super well. It's oriented more towards like a resident server that runs somewhere. And that's not particularly a favorable thing for what's supposed to be like a, a decentralized community driven packaging, like packaged data solution, right? Like you can't, you don't want to take a datomic binary blob out of Redis and ship that around. It's not a particularly great idea. Um, there's some other cool stuff, you know, uh, turns out CoreLogic has a library, PLDB written, um, Richard Norman, I think is the guy's name back in Austin, um, that implements, you know, sort of a, a data log like there's data script, that's a data log for the browser and closure or end closure as well. Uh, and there's intention, which is Alan Dipert's like, we're going to use data log to go pull apart maps and do like recursive querying on your structures and memory. And these are like all pretty cool. Um, but they're all or nothing right? They, they, there's no persistence model here that's incremental. You fundamentally have to go deserialize this entire thing off of disk and stick it in main memory and then like go do a bunch of scanning over it. And the assumption is that you can do that and it's efficient. Um, and there's data hike. Data hike is actually really cool. It's from the replicative folks. Um, and the idea is they took data script and did a straight port of data script on top of a really interesting um, durable version of closures maps. So is this is actually the only thing on the list here that to my taste is open source and has a meaningful serialization model. Um, the, this, the hitchhiker tree behind data hike is very interesting. Um, but you know, building things is fun. And why would I go let someone else have all the fun of just, you know, using their library. So let's, let's go build one of these things. Um, the goal here, right, we're, we're, we want to be able to merge many stores together. Fundamentally, I want to like take a bunch of other people's documentation artifact data and merge it together into a single repository, which is great because we're operating data log and data logs is tuples and sets so merging sets is easy. Um, we assume point reads. This is kind of a debatable thing. Um, I am new to this industry. Redis and you know modern NoSQL stores that are fundamentally distributed and point read optimized are kind of the new hotness. And this is just an assumption that I chose to make. Um, this is not a thing that's reasonable given industry context or different models of spinning disks. This is just what I'm going with here. Because for me, I want um, shelving my data log to sit on top of like the JVM's resource model or something else that's fundamentally point optimized and that it's not possible to look through or that gives you point semantics and it's not possible to look through to like really understand what it's doing under the hood. Um, key space scans in, in order to do any like cross product or intersection join stuff, you need to be able to do a scan. So you can, you know, go enumerate the whole thing and filter it down yourself. Um, and I want schemas. I'll harp on this in a little bit, but the, another thing that I noticed because I've actually used P, uh, CoreLogic's PLDB and some of these other things before, they don't have a notion of a schema. In fact, data log itself is basically untyped, um, which makes it very difficult to build a data log database of any meaningful scale or manipulate it at any meaningful scale, so let alone evolve it. Um, I've repeatedly had programs blow up because like I dropped a single tuple element somewhere, which meant that none of my joins worked and nothing was working for no debuggable reason. I had to go like back through very large data files to try and understand what went wrong. Um, all right, so let's do it. We're, we're gonna go engage in this mad science project and build, and build a data log. Um, so storage models, right? How, how are we gonna you know, go stick stuff on disk? I, I said earlier that I wanted incremental serialization and I do, um, but this is an MVP. I'm, I'm building this thing as a science project on the side. I'm just gonna slurp and load. I'm sorry, I, I'm, I promise I will go add incremental deserialization later. Um, there are totally lots of interesting ways to do it, but for the sake of demo, you know, let's assume at least we can implement, you know, a, an append only write log correctly, right? You know, we're just going to take tuples, we're going to stick them in a write log. And, you know, if we want to scan, we scan the whole thing, we filter the whole thing. And it's going to be like hysterically inefficient, but at least we can get it correct, right? And if I can build a query engine that operates on this basis and show that it's correct and does the right thing, then we can go swap out other things that fundamentally share the same API and test that 
you know, the right log based stupid one at least does the same thing as the supposedly optimized one. And that way we can say, you know, make sure the optimized one isn't wrong somewhere it's not getting indexing wrong or something else. Um, right, cool, schemas. So, you know, the, the sequence of tuples thing, I already mentioned this, like it, it kind of went sideways for me in the past. I, I did a really big project back in college that was um, an implantation, implantation of a game engine based on like taking an, a big old XML file and extracting a bunch of data from it and sticking it in PLDB. And it was just a complete nightmare. I had to go reinvent my own like record structure thing um, on top of, I actually go check out, uh, whoop. So I can actually go open this up. And that's probably completely unreadable. And I can't figure out how to zoom it, whatever. We'll just keep rolling. Um, like I wound up building my own record constructors and a bunch of other helper code to like help me manage the fact that I needed to generate consistent data that fundamentally had the same sort of like tuple, like keys, keyed maps, which are the closure like record equivalent to ordered tuples to things in PLDB mapping and back again. And like that entire normalization and insertion then extraction and renormalization pipeline was inefficient and difficult to maintain and just didn't make any sense. Um, good news is that we now have closure spec alpha, right? We have spec, this is fundamentally a thing designed for talking about data in a forwards compatible way. Um, and so the, one of the things I've done with shelving that's been really kind of fun is use spec, probably misuse spec, um, to talk about my data storage format and, and data compatibility. So, you know, this is a trade-off. There, there are certainly people that will go, yeah, schemas, types, why are you even doing that? Um, have you tried to use like random unstructured blobs out of Redis? Good luck. Um, this is just the way my brain thinks. I fall more on the Haskell side of the house when it comes to this. So we have specs. There's two kinds of specs to be precise. Um, there's values which have like value semantics, right? They're, they're, they're unique by their content hash. It's a, a SHA-512 sum that gets truncated to a UUID. Um, and there's records which have UUID four IDs and have place semantics. So you like technically shelving does have um, place in this sense, like you can have a record that you update by, you know, writing a new one to the same key. But the whole notion is we're going to have like lots of values that are set theory that are like have set semantics. And we're just going to pull them apart and stick them in the store and pull them back out and search them. So let's actually, you know, do a demo here. We'll, we'll just reuse the states example from above. So, you know, I'm going to define a spec that's just, I have a name, you know, have a lot of string named things in this demo, unfortunately. And so we have a, a state, the state is just the name and the type tag. So, you know, constructor function. Um, and we also are going to need a city, right? So we want to know cities are in states. So, you know, another one that's just takes a, a state and a name and generates a tuple map. Um, and we have a capital, right? Which is the, the capital tag thing from earlier. So we can go, you know, make a shelving schema. So we're going to take the empty schema and we're just going to insert a bunch of um, value specs into it. We're just going to say, hey, shelving, this is a schema that is, this is a closure spec that's now known to you. It's a value treated as such. Um, and because I didn't want to go type it all out, we're going to turn on automatic relation creation. So what's going to happen here is when we write to shelving, this is the fun part, um, shelving actually is going to go Let's say we have a connection. There's a whole lot of stuff in here. Um, but this is just, we're going to drop this key. All right, this is hopefully a little bit more readable. So this is a shelving connection, right? So we're, we have a, a connection to the map type shelf. This is a, well, let's, let's go do the log shelf, sorry. So we'll do log shelf. Cool. All right. So the log shelf is just a map that happens to have like a big old state in it. And the state is just a write log, as I was suggesting earlier. 
So it is, you know, this is actually the first element, the only element in our write log right now is the schema itself. So we're saying, okay, well, we have uh, no automatic specs. So if we see an unknown spec, we're gonna throw an error and we have automatic relations are on. So as we're recursively walking specs here to insert them into the data store, normalizing the tuple form, we will implicitly create um, relations for the specs we already know about. So, you know, there's a couple things already here. So we have our state, right? That is related to, that happens to have relation. So the, the, the state, um, structure has a city and a state, right? Or at least it relates to cities. We have a relation from cities to states and cities similarly have a relation from cities to names and cities to states and cities to types, right? So we're just walking key value pairs here based on the spec of the overall structure and the spec of the key, right? So you can think of this as a straight transform of like the S keys form. And the rest of this just like follows this pattern. We're just, you know, running down the schema here saying this is what's what we know of and here and here's how we support it. Right. Um, and then there's a relations map that describes for all these relations. Here's what they come from. Here's what they go to. And here's what they're actually the inverse of some other relations. So we can only you know do one insertion. All right. Bunch of nonsense there. Let's go throw some data in this. So all right, we take our connection, we're just gonna go, you know, throw a bunch of tuples into this thing, right? So we're gonna, you know, insert into the city spec, this tuple, you know, Alaska Janu, and we're gonna put Arizona Phoenix and Arkansas Little Rock and, you know, kind of on down the line, same as from the demo earlier. Okay, cool, nil. No. That doesn't tell us anything interesting. Let's take a look at the right log, because we can just do that. All right. Unique by what? In the naive in the naive write log implementation, you can. In the map implementation that we may or may not have time to go over, no, you can't. You will you in the map implementation will get you real value semantics. The write log is not that smart because it's not supposed to be that smart. Um, there's no compaction or anything else in in the write log. Okay. Remember to repeat questions. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the, the question there was whether the uh, write log version that I'm going through right now does compaction or not, and uh, whether there's a uniqueness requirement as a result. Okay, well, this is like, it's unfortunately, it's difficult to read, but fundamentally, the write log now have, that we've put some stuff in it consists of a bunch of tuples, right? The, the first element here is an ID that, you know, says, well, the, the spec is a city and the UID is something, right? And then we have a relation here that's, you know, we're going to relate the, sorry, so this is a relation. We're relating the U ID on the, the, the shelving ID on the left via the relation in the middle to the ID on the right. So here we're just saying, you know, the, this, this city with this ID relates to the name with this ID. And there's just a whole bunch of these, right? So we can say, you know, here's the name Phoenix and it has the, the ID of this. And so we can actually just, you know, go find all the things that Phoenix relates to recursively by going and poking around and finding all the places where this occurs, right? And, and that's exact, exactly what we expect. The whole point of this thing is we're gonna go take the map form that we generated and we're gonna deform it into tuples and stick it in the store and we can pull it back out again. Okay, so this is sort of working, but that this is like looking at the right log is a pretty unconvincing demo as far as I'm concerned. It, it's pretty difficult to read this whole thing. Um, so let's go take a look at some query, at doing some queries. Scheme migrations, as, as an aside, if we go look at the write log, um, there's a couple places in here where you can see the schema changed, right? So remember that the schema was actually the first thing that we put in the write log. Um, and if we go like poke around in here, there's some other, there's some plate, there should be places where the schema was replaced because we inserted uh, relations into the write log that were not previously known. Um, okay. So query planning, um, query parsing rather. Let's just go run a query to prove that it works. And it didn't because the query is wrong. Oh, right. City does demo dot city dot slash state is no longer the thing. There we go. Okay. So the, the query compiler takes a data log query in some form that supports both the datomics uh, vector query form and the, and the map query form, and it compiles it down to a function. The function is of the connection. 
and any find parameters, so or any in parameters. So, date, so Datomic actually is the only data log I found that lets you, you know, have like a, an abstract or parameterizable query. Um, and so the in notation, it lets you say, these are logic variables that the user will specify later when you actually go and run the query. And so here we, you know, we only have one in, so we need to go find the, a city. So we're gonna go say Little Rock. So this is gonna, you know, go search our database with the given connection to find for any city ID where the city name is, in this case, you know, is something, right? Little Rock, given our, our logic variable binding of in. Go find the state by unifying on this part here and that's the name of the state, so bind that out, where the capital name happens to align with the city name we gave it, right? So this should you know, give us back the binding that you know, state here, if we go run this whole thing, unifies down to Arkansas, which is correct. So that's you know, at least working. Um, one fun thing that shelving goes and does is in order to support both of these forms, it actually does so using um, specs conform and unform logic. So if you think about conform and unform, the notion of conform is you can go take some data structure, you can bring it back down to a normal form that's described by like the spec, the spec parse of um, your grammar. And you can write a spec such that both of these two, like the vector form of this thing and the map form of this thing, actually have the same normal form. Um, and so I'm not going to go through the actual spec code for this because it's really difficult to read. Um, but I will show you the test for this, which is really cute to my taste. Shelving source test. The parser test is actually really neat because what it does is it takes, it generates a map data log example and it conforms it as though it was map data log, which it is. And then we can actually unform it. Um, so we round trip, right? We, we take a map example and we conform it and then we unform it to generate the sequence equivalent. And then we conform that and assert that the two normal forms are equal, right? So we can actually use specs data to test that the map form and the list form strictly round trip through each other into the same normal form, which just, you know, gives me a high degree of certainty in my parser rather than like having gone written some hand rolled thing that I'd have to generate many examples for. This lets me say generically, you know, hey, I have these two forms. They're completely, you know, relatable to each other through this normal form. Go prove that or disprove that if you can. And this happens to work. All right, cool. Um, so that's a normal form parser. So we have some queries. Uh, we even you know, managed to run one. Let's, let's do some query planning here, right? How, how are we actually going to take tuples and turn them into data again, question mark? Like, how does any of this work? Um, so we're gonna go reach through the scenery here. So require shelving.query, uh, refer Q did I move these? I have to go read some code, sorry. How are we doing on time? Seven. All right, so the query namespace like has all these horrendously named vars. What it's actually doing is it's exposing the, in, the internal details of how, how I do query compilation. So QBang is the same as Atomic's Q operator that just runs a query. Um, so you just give it a query and your, your connection, your query, and you know, you're in bindings directly as arguments and just goes and runs the whole thing. Um, there's a cache implicitly in the middle here that, you know, caches the compilation results of your queries. So if you go do something stupid where you're just like Q banging a whole bunch in a row in one like hot loop, you're not actually going to recompile queries because it turns out to be expensive. Um, but Q actually like does the compile. It's the thing I've been running that, you know, returns a function you have to call by hand. Um, and so what we're going to do here is we're actually going to walk through, starting with the worst named one, Q star four. Exciting. Uh, that was how many stars it took to get all the way back to, yeah, it just kept stacking stars going back up. Sorry? Why, what the, why that many stars? 
So um, we're just going to refer all. So shelving dot query refer all. Don't try this at home, kids. All right. Who's ready for four stars? So Q star star, all the stars. All right. So all this is going to do is it's going to take our query and you know give us a representation of what even this is doing. So we're going to you know our, our find is the only logic variable we're finding is state. Our where you know is the same where clause we gave it initially, which is the sequence of, of, of bindings. We have our in, and then we have this dependency map. So you've got, you know, the, the initial pass is just go compile, you know, a, a def use graph that shows these are what the specs map to. Um, and it actually went and collected some type information as well. So for each logic variable, we actually have a guess at what the spec for the logic variable will be. So we know what, like, what table to go look for it in. Um, and we know what clauses it occurs in. And we can just kind of keep walking back down the list of stars here. So the first pass just says like an initial pass. The second one like actually does a topological sort. So now we know like what order we're going to go traverse all the tables in to go find logic variable binding possibilities so that we can go emit code for all this. Um, you know, most of this hasn't changed. We're just accreting here. Q2 stars. I forget what this one does. Let's see. Oh, right. So this one actually compiles down to a plan. So this one says, you know, here's an intermediate logic variable. And what we're going to do here is we're going to project this relation, you know, the, the relationship between names and capitals left from cities. Um, and, and we're just going to kind of go down the line here, taking either full scans of a given spec to generate sequences of IDs or doing projections from a given ID through relation to IDs on the other side of the relation. So the, the whole idea here is we can use relation compilation information, that sounded horrendous, um, to actually do minimal projections across uh, specs. So again, this is all kind of like aimed towards the map case where we have real relation maps. We're not doing a full table scan. Um, we, we can run efficient queries. All right, and then the final one is the scariest one. This will actually give us a compiled closure form. So we actually like have a big old F, a big old function of your connection in your city that's a, like a transduce of a bunch of comps and mat cats through like this whole mess that's taking your connection and just using the closure API to go pull data and ID example out examples out of it and map cat it all down. So the idea here is you have a sequence, you generate a sequence of states. So maps from logic variable names, to logic variable bindings, and you run that through this whole pipeline. And at every single step in the pipeline, you're taking a single state and you're generating a sequence of, one, of zero or more states back out, right? So a filter in this, you know, if we're actually gonna do a row level, a row level or a join for instance, is we're gonna take a sequence of a single state in, and we're gonna say yes or no, does this match our criteria? Which is, do these fields line up? If they do, great, we'll return that single state. Otherwise, we you know, return an empty sequence back. And the whole map cap model says, okay, well, we took one in and we produced nothing out. Keep going till we get something, right? And it's just a transducer comp stack. And there happens to be a whole lot of this. It, the transducer thing actually worked out much better than I expected. The original version of this like compiled down to a four macro, which was even worse and much less performant. Um, this is kind of fun. We actually have you know, a compile, a, an evaluated closure function here. We can just go call if we want to that doesn't close over connection. It doesn't assume anything about the connection. We just handed the connection, some logic variable bindings, and away we go. Okay, almost there. So the, like, the scary bit here is a traditional query planner is mostly like aimed around disk IO minimization, right? Because disk IO is really slow compared to like going through a buffer in memory. Um, and shelving just like doesn't have the, the tight coupling to a given platform to really be able to do that. Um, so like most of the query planning research kind of goes right out the window because it's all about like adaptive scheduling for looking at the distribution of like data in your columns. Um, we we're just, you know, doing this, you know, it, take your, do, do a data flow analysis, emit a filter tree and done dance. Um, 
there's some fun stuff I want to do here. Um, you know, you can use the cardinality of given spec to kind of like order. So you take the topological sort and you restore it stably so that the um, smallest spec comes first, right? This way you're joining, you're doing the most joins and the most restrictive join you possibly can. You never have to do like a big project out to like thousands of examples and a filter back down to two, you start or a join back down to two. You start with that scan on two and then like maybe do a couple projects that tend to be pretty small on average. Um, and you know, the big one of course would be actually rather than doing like multiple scans, you can interleave scans. So if you know two logic variables, don't depend on each other data wise, you can actually do a scan on both of them at the same time in the same step. You don't have to have separate steps that are doing the uh, full matrix product of like the one state space by the other state space, uh, which saves you a bunch of filtering potentially. Um, and like that's the whole song and dance. So you know, there's some machinery here I haven't gone through because this already felt like entirely too much material um, that like is a custom closure spec interpreter for taking a spec and manually parsing the S form of that spec to manually do the same walk. So I can do like a tree order walk based on conform through specs to do the full data structure to tuple normal form and reprojection, um, which was really fun to go right. But like, this is it. This is all it takes to build a database. All. Yes. Um, I don't know. Are you familiar with So, how is the, how is the uh, so the question was, am I familiar with Mentat or Datomish? And the answer is I'm not. Um, this was, this started out as like a toy database project because like I never got to take a database class in school. So I just wanted to like, you know, go build this thing and see what it looked like. Um, and I think if this was a more serious project, there's a bunch of prior, good prior art for um, optimized Java uh, data log implementations that I probably would have reached for first, but those would be very interesting to go kind of poke at. Um, so, you know, there's some other goodies. Um, API management wise, this has been an interesting learning experience. Um, I used uh, Zach Tillman's import. Originally, this whole thing was like a single closure file that got like 5,000 lines long. It was completely out of hand. Um, and like one of the things I wanted to do was, you know, provide a documented API that faced a user and provide a documented API that faced an implementer of a new shelf layer, right? Because I wanted to be able to go drop in, you know, like a memcache or a Redis storage layer behind this thing and get more serious database performance out of it, you know, uh, rather than, you know, full like Eden slurp read nonsense. Um, and like using Zach's import vars to do this sort of worked. Um, this has led to a lot of really, not, like, it let me clean up the code a lot. It let me clean up the apparent order a lot, but there wound up being a lot of really nasty issues around, um, there are now implicit dependencies on the code load order of the whole thing because closure can't do module level circular dependencies properly. Um, so that's been less than pleasing to kind of debug by hand. Um, and documentation generation, I'll, switch over to the GitHub repo here. I'm actually very proud of, um, let me see if I can zoom this in somehow. How do I even, I need to get like a thousand percent here. Sorry? All right, cool, that'll work. Is this like remotely legible? All right, maybe. So I'll, I'll just fit the whole thing. Um, so like all the documentation for shelving is actually generated. There is a script um, that I wrote that like goes and rewrites markdown. So it, it takes your, it blows up all your code, code, parses the markdown files in the repo, finds uh, markdown style references to your vars. So like here we have a, a var that links to empty schema and that link is dead. Good grief. <laughs> oh, well, pride cometh before the fall. The fall. Um, Oh, right, because this is a Potemkin, yeah, this is a Potemkin messing with me. Um, anyway, oh, I'm really disappointed that did not just work. Shoot, this totally worked like two weeks ago when I touched the code last. Um, but the idea here is I have, I'm actually able to go like parse markdown files and, and locate headers that name a var and re dynamically re-replace those with proper generated links to the source location. So I'm able to go build this 
tree that shows me, you know, what VARs aren't documented because I can go check and count and see what they occurred in the source code. I can go regenerate VARs based on, in, on index information. So I always have all the VARs documented or not, and I'm able to go cross link back and forth between the sources. Um, and that's worked out honestly better than I expected. I, I've been trying to like take this script and clean it up into something that's more generally useful. Um, so I think it's an interesting idea at least. Um, so whenever I finish shaving this yak, there's another yak that I'll go move on to that's like finishing my documentation generation project and that's gonna be the core of it. So there's a lot of fun, you know, other stuff you could do here that's fun. You know, negation recursive rules I mentioned. Um, backends are kind of fun. It's, it's very easy to write a backend for this it, kind of deliberately, that was a design goal. Um, and so I want to, you know, go grab like a rocks DB or something and throw that behind this and get to get to the place where I have incremental serialization can you have to do incremental scans. Um, implementing transactions would be kind of fun because you can actually use the log structured shelf as a write log locally and have an overlay um, shelf where you like your writes go into the write log until you commit and then you flush the write log and an all or nothing go to like a backing store. So you could actually go build like a real database driver on top of this very, very easily. Um, the ergonomics I'm less than pleased with at the end of the day. It was kind of not a thing that I ever designed for. It just kind of happened that way. But like aesthetically, this, this sucks. Just going you know, to be upfront about that. Um, and the query language, even if you, you know, do some lifting here so we can, you know, we can tag this, then we can do this. Um, we can drop this. There's actually a type inferencer in here. That's kind of fun. Um, so we can say from this. And what this will do is this actually goes ahead and this will uh, take your city value. It'll hash ID it and then do all your joins against the value hash ID through the entire rest of the thing as if it were a value that had been extracted like in a normal ID scan. Um, and then the type inferencer can come through and figure out that, you know, okay, I already know that city exists on the right hand side. Um, and so you don't need to specify that in these two places. And, and like that helps clean this up some, but fundamentally, like this is still nowhere near as neat as like the untagged, unstru like the untyped unstructured data log that we, you know, kind of initially went through. And I don't have, I don't have insight on how to like really get that into a better place. Um, and I do want to finish you know, replacing Grimoire at some point, but that doesn't seem likely considering where this is. So that's kind of all the material I got. Thank you for, are you what am I hiding? That, that's, oh, yeah, I should have just used a SQL. Oh, well, Lesson, <laughs> lessons learned. This is fun. Um, questions, comments, you're a mad scientist. I don't know. Uh, I'll repeat questions. Portland, do you have anything? Nope. But oh. thanks. Okay. Um, anyone here? Yes. Have you written um, specs for like closure code and metadata yet? And what would they look like? Uh, have I written, so the question was, have I written specs for closure code and closure metadata yet? And the answer is sort of. Um, so I can actually go grab uh, I'm gonna grab my REPL here because that's gonna be a little bit closer. Source dev grimoire. So I have a, I have some code that's a sketch of what a, a replacement grimoire store would look like under this sort of data model. And this is kind of the, the example that motivated a lot of the design decisions that went into this whole project. Um, and the neat thing here is like, it's, it's actually done using multi-specs, um, which is hard for shelving because like you can't actually check multi-spec consistency in a data store that knows nothing about closure or multi-spec loading or like any of that stuff. It's just kind of, it's like the spooky intermediary thing where you have to trust that the multi-specs are consistent on either side of the, like the serialization boundary. Um, but conceptually the, the new architecture is supposed to be, okay, well, we have a package and there's some things that are instances of packages, like a Maven package is the most obvious one. Um, and you can, you know, go from a package to a spec, which is this, you know, the multi-spec projector. Um, and then you have entities, which are things we might want to store information about. Um, and so the most obvious, like, you know, we, we want to attach entities to packages or uh, you know, information to packages at the end of the day. Um, so, you know, maybe you want to be able to have metadata, like actual metadata or some doc string attached to a package. Um, you can also, you know, have a closure entity, right? Which is a package or namespace and a name. And that itself is a thing you could 
have concealed live documentation for, right? Because namespace have to have namespace level doc strings and namespace level metadata. Um, and you have defs, same sort of concept, right? You know, it, it's, a, it's a thing that is treed off of a namespace. You can relate them through the namespace hierarchy or join, a, join on them through namespaces. Um, that itself is gonna, you know, be a thing you could attach annotations to by, by reference. Um, and then annotations are, you know, metadata and text and all these other things that are all, you know, necessarily keyed off of a thing that's either an entity or a package of entities. Uh, and that's kind of the, the, the model I want, I hope to get to. Um, this totally works. It just isn't, I don't know, like I'm not fully sold on it yet. Um, I, reading back through some of Richard's data architecture, um, it's very close to what he came up with for the Granada project. Um, it manages to convey a lot of the same things about, you know, what the spec of your data is, what the structure of data is, what the intentional interpretation is. It totally has the merge semantics I want. Um, but like it definitely does not provide the same soundness properties as like a real SQL table or anything else. Cause like I'm totally just abusing specs dynamic dispatch here to say, well, this relates to like some other completely unknowable unprojectable thing. And if you don't have that code loaded, you don't know about it either. So we get off. Okay. I guess like you don't join against quite as many things, but that sort of works. Um, and that's, that's kind of my sketch right now, you know, so the, the goal here, this is the thing I never got to in Grimoire. Grimoire never got articles, right? There, there was never a good way to sit down and write the, the article that talks about VARs, the article that talks about namespace, the article that talks about transactions, right? Because they're, they're not things that fit nicely in the silos of def level documentation or namespace level documentation or package level documentation. Um, and fundamentally the innovation of this whole project was, okay, well, what if I could have like an article that's, you know, fundamentally the same sort of annotation thing on top of, you know, a package or an entity that I can then box up and ship around. Cause then you can go write, you know, the missing articles for closure kind of. Um, so I, I think that that's kind of the best example that I have of like what may be a real use of, the, of this in, in the way that I think of this would look like is it's clearly this data architecture is massively overkill for traditional like row column store. It, it's really aimed at something much looser than that. Other questions? Yes. Hey, I'm a great talk. Thanks. Um, I'm kind of naive about this, but I guess like you're talking about generating documentation for closure or um, core stuff. Mm -hmm. fact. So why, why not just add documentation to the so the question was, why am I even doing this? Why am I trying to attach documentation to closure after the fact? Um, and the polite short answer is there is 10 years of JIRA and GitHub history showing that core will not accept patches to their documentation for various reasons. Other questions? Yes. So the question is, given that the notation is a logic variable relationship logic variable, can you get the, can you take a query and get into the form you actually see the relationship given a pair of logic variables? Um, yes, so the, the query planner has that data implicitly if it manages to type in for your query in an internally consistent way. So one of the things that the, that the query planner does is it goes through and collects all the type information you provided and does a consistency check of sorts. It's, it's a really naive check, but it's a check nonetheless. Um, that's the actually what blew up earlier in my demo when I tried to run that query and didn't compile. That was because I had a, I'd referenced an inconsistent query for the right hand side or the, the right hand column, um, inconsistent spec for the right hand column. Um, I'm really glad I went and added it that, that saved my butt a bunch of times in development. Um, but the, so yes, the query planner can go figure that out given a query, um, but it doesn't know ahead of time whether any tuples exist that satisfy those constraints, obviously. Um, and it, the system as currently architected was never designed to really go extract that information ex un unless you like want to go become the compiler's customer yourself. But that's also why I went and did the whole like Q4 stars like exposed pipeline thing. So I can go debug that by hand and someone else could potentially go hook into that or some of that as well. 
Um, there's no middleware pattern or anything else that would like let you in dynamically inject like extra analysis passes or something though. Yeah. You mentioned that you entered, uh, you, uh, you wrote a spec parser and you could walk the data along with the specs if I understand correctly. That's something that's generally useful, like uh, spec tools, separate library, mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, the question was, I, I claimed that I'd written a thing that let you walk uh, in parallel with specs walk. Uh, and the answer is yes, I totally have. Um, is it a thing that's generally usable? Um, that's up for debate. So Alex Miller will probably see this talk if he even watches it and recoil in horror because I'm definitely doing things that are violating the intentional API of closure spec. So I can actually go, just go walk through this code kind of quickly. There's not that much here. It's just like a bunch of boilerplate to like get the whole thing proper, properly written. Um, fundamentally, it's, it's just like a, a straight port of um, the closure spec walk or of, of closure course uh, walk implementation. So you have you know, a before function and after function and the thing you're gonna walk um, and a spec you're gonna walk with, right? And so what we're gonna do here, like we're gonna say recursively walk with spec and your spec keyword, and we're actually gonna get the spec instance and your object, and your before function, your after function, right? And then walk with spec star is just a multi-method that as you can see is like doing this whole dance to actually match on the conform star output of a spec, which gives you like the fully qualified uh, symbol names, right? So I deliberately chose to walk on the conform star output as opposed to conform output, um, because the conform output is not namespace qualified and I don't know if they're going to expose a public API later. So this at, le this at least like let me kind of hard code against known publicly facing symbol and var names as opposed to like doing something else funky internally. But yeah, like in my testing at least, this is a, I will claim correct uh, recursive walk, like however you want to use it through spec. Um, the, impl the use case for this is so go grab shelving's core here. Um, the, ins the implementation of insertion does a bunch of stuff, but the main thing it's doing is it's saying, okay, well, I have a queue, right? And I'm going to uh, take the first thing off of the queue, which starts out like, you know, as a record with a spec and an ID, and I'm going to recursively break it apart if it's not a record star by doing like this decompose thing that actually does the recursive walk to generate all the substruct, to extract all the structure substructures and um, tuple form them. And then, you know, go insert all those and like do the whole dance. Um, where's that impl? Whoa, hello. Can't even type here. Uh, and yeah, decompose is just saying, you know, walk through aliases, walk through multi-specs. So it'll actually like go as far as it has to go given your data structure. Um, and then just like accumulate whatever comes back using like the, the walk with a, a pre-function, a post-function that maintains a stack of where you are. And so like walking down is push, walking back up is pop. It, it's just like a depth first search that maintains appropriate tagging information in some state. Um, This is completely insane. Nobody should do this. Nobody should use this for anything. I, I, this is like a science project entirely. Uh, I'm amused it works, to be completely honest. But like, this, this is totally a thing you could go do. It's gonna perform like utter garbage. Um, other questions? Okay, we'll wrap it up. Um, thanks so much. I hope that you at least found this amusing, if not enlightening in some degree. Um, and I'll have another science project for you eventually. Thanks. Paco, you guys in Portland have any questions? No, we're good. Cool. Um, we're probably going to take a break, a small break, right?